Another really important concept in trigonometry is the idea of arc length, with the relationship between, say, a, a circular arc. The, you know the angle and you know the radius of the circular arc. You want to find that curve, that curved length right there. So for instance, let's do something that's not super complicated. Let's create a 90 degree angle right here. Let's say these are uh, this is a three inch radius, three inches and three inches. We said 90 degrees right here, and we want to know if this is a perfect circle. We want to know the length of that arc. Beautifully for finding arc lengths of circular sectors, we actually have formulas that do that for this, but I wanna make sure why we have those formulas the way we do is very clear, and then show you how beautifully it works for radians, which kind of will start to illuminate why we're using radians often in trigonometry instead of degrees. So if we want to find the length of this arc, what we do, we just consider, well, what if this was a full circle? Let's see if I can make this look like a circle. Not too bad. And then what if we found the circumference of that whole circle and then just multiply that or divide it by whatever fraction of that circle we have right there. So we know the circumference of a circle is pi times that diameter, but in terms of radius, which we have right here in these cases, it'd be two pi r, or two times the radius times pi, pi times diameter. But in this case, again, if we want only the 90 degrees as our interior angle right here, we don't want the full circumference. What we want to do is multiply this by the fractional amount of the full circle we have. Well, in this case, we have a full circle is 360 degrees. What we're going to do is multiply it by a factor of whatever that angle is divided by 360. And to show you why that's the case, again, because 90 degrees is one fourth of this, that's what we want, is one fourth of what would be this entire circle right here. So if we calculate this length right here, we have two pi times our radius, which is three inches right here, times this factor right here, which is 90 over 360. Um, just to clean this up, this will be six pi inches, times this reduces down to one fourth. So importantly here, if we had a full circle with a radius of three inches, the circumference would be six pi inches all the way around, but we only want one fourth of that. Um, and just to put this together, let's reduce that, divide that by two, divide that by two. What I get is three pi over two inches is the exact arc length of this arc, the circular arc right here, with a radius of three inches and an interior angle of 90 degrees. Importantly to say here is I'm leaving this in the exact form. I can multiply three times pi in my calculator and divide by two to get an approximation. Generally, we're gonna like exact answers like this. Also, I can reduce this arc length formula for degrees. Uh, I can divide this by two, that by two to get 180 right here. And what it looks like I get is theta times pi divide, oh, times r, excuse me, over 180. So this right here is the, the um, formula to find the arc length of a circular arc, as in this case right here, if I know my radius and the interior angle. Let's now do the exact same problem, but in radians. And what you're going to see is the first instance when it becomes extremely clear why radians are more powerful and easier to use when dealing with these angles on circles. All right, so we have the exact same setup, but now instead of writing the interior angle as 90 degrees, I wrote it as pi over two radians. And importantly, this formula changes a little bit in a beautiful way that you'll see. But what I want to do now is if I'm in radians in this case, a full circle in terms of radians is two pi. And so what I'll do is I'll take that interior angle in terms of radians and divide it by two pi to get that fractional piece right there. But now instead of actually do finding the length and then going back and simplifying this, I wanna simplify this now because it becomes awesomely simple. If you'll see in this case, we have these factors of two pi in this formula and in this fractional piece right here, because this is the fractional piece of the full circle. This arc length formula reduces down to the radius times the angle right here. Again, before we move forward, compare that to the formula we ended up with with degrees. In degrees, we had the angle times pi times the radius divided by this factor of 180. But if our angle is given to us in terms of radians, to find the arc length, we simply gotta take the radius 
times that angle right here. And it should be clear from our last answer, it's gonna be exactly the same. In this case, if I use this formula, my radius is three inches, and I'm multiplying that by the radian angle of pi over two. In this case right here, that would be three pi over two inches, which is a whole heck of a lot easier. I know I've already said this a few times, but I want to again just emphasize at this point is as we move forward in trigonometry, while we still will use degrees a bit as we move forward, our main focus is going to be working with this radian measure. So I highly suggest that you spend time just getting more comfortable with this. At zero, we have pi is 180, 360 is 2 pi, getting all of those small angles instead, trying to get as in tune with that angular measure as you are with degrees early in a trigonometry class can really make your life a lot easier. All right, so now for what I think is the most important concept as the foundation for trigonometry, the idea of similar triangles. What I have here isn't the rigorous definition of similar triangles, but it's the one that we need to build the tri trig functions that we're going to very soon. Importantly here, two triangles are similar if their angle measures are the same. So we have two different triangles right here, one that's completed with all the angles and all the side measures. Here I'm a bit ambiguous because I haven't written any side measures, but what I do know is as soon as I write in side measures here, they are definitely going to be similar because all of their angle measures are exactly the same. And in fact, these are right triangles. These are right triangles because they have a 90 degree angle in them. The important piece to trigonometry is the fact that the respective sides of similar triangles are proportional. And what that means is just this right here. If we know these have the same angular measure, and then someone walks along and says, oh, this triangle right here, I know that this side right here is nine. Right away then, I know the measures of these other sides, because in this case, this side, which is the same side as this one, the one joining the 90 degree angle and the 53 degree angle, this is three times the size of this right here. And what we then know is that these sides must be three times their respective sides. So this side, this hypotenuse, which is across from the right angle, this is 15. And then across from here, this would be 12 because it's three times. Another way of thinking about this is if I divide three, take three and divide it by four, that measure right there will be the same if I take nine divided by 12. That's that concept of being proportional. So this is where things start to get fun. Since we have this idea of similar triangles, if we can get some, say, basic or unit triangles that we can base things on, trigonometry, which will be based off these kinds of triangles, will allow us to do some crazier measurements later on. What I mean by that is this. We have two special triangles that are very important to us, the 45, 45, 90, and the 30, 60, 90. What we know is this, is if we have a triangle right here, that is a 90 degree angle. I didn't draw this exactly to scale. Well, none of this is to scale. You're getting used to it probably. If this is a 45 degree angle and this is a 45 degree angle right here, and that's a 90 degree angle, what I know is that the triangle exists of this type would be have side lengths of one right here. And then using the Pythagorean theorem, I would get the square root of two. That might not be extremely obvious to you, but this is pretty easy to figure out. Because of these measures of 45 and 45 are the same, these sides have to be exactly the same. And I chose a one, but it doesn't matter. I chose one to make it easier. But the idea is if these measure angles are the same, then these side lengths have to also be exactly the same because the size of the angle determines the length of that opposite side. Um, and then the square root of two just comes from the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Then our second special triangle is the 30, 60, 90. And in this case right here, what we know is the relationship between these sides right here it would be if this is a one, this hypotenuse is always twice that length. And then if we know those, given the Pythagorean theorem, we can find out that this is the square root of three. These two triangles right here and the idea of similar triangles are the absolute foundation for building our trigonometric functions that you're going to see very, very soon. 
but importantly, have versions of these written down. And what I mean by that is you can have this version of this version, or you can scale them all you want and you won't lose any of the important information. Often what you're gonna see that we do is we want the hypotenuse to be one. So we divide this by two, divide that by two, and that by that by two, or in this case, divide each of these lengths by the square root of two. Also, if part of you is wondering, wait, where did you get those measures? I kind of understood what you were talking about over here, but you didn't see anything about that. Right after this, at the end of this video, I'm going to show you the proof of both of these. But if you don't stick around for those proofs, I just want to say I'm excited for you to learn trigonometry. Trigonometry is one of, for many people, one of the most difficult concepts to get because it's very different than things you've done before but it's incredibly powerful and has uses throughout sciences and a higher level mathematics. It is, to me, one of the most important areas of mathematics. So our premise here is that we have a 45, 45, 90 triangle, and we're trying to find one complete triangle. We want to complete by finding all of these sides. What we first need to do is define a length for one of these. And as I had said before, what we do is we can choose this or these, it won't matter. But if I chose this length right here to be a one, I know for sure that this length also has to be one, one foot, one inch, whatever it is, because these angle measures are exactly the same. That's a really foundational thing. I'm not gonna prove that concept, but for triangles, the size of that angle determines directly the length of that opposite length right there. And so if these are the same, these must be the same. And I know that if I have this hypotenuse right here, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so and this is one plus one is two equals c squared. Take the square root of both sides. I get that c equals the square root of two. And as I said before, actually what we're going to want to use is the triangle that has a hypotenuse of one. So if I divide each of these lengths by the square root of two, what I'll get is the 45, 45, 90 triangle that has a length here of one. So I divide by the square root of two. Here, I get one over the square root of two. Here, I get one over the square root of two. But also, we don't like to write these where we have a, a radical in the denominator. If I multiply the numerator and the denominator here by the square root of two to rationalize the denominator, another way of writing this is the square root of two over two. All right, so we've defended the 45, 45, 90 degree triangle that has a hypotenuse of one. Let's now talk about the 30, 60, 90. This is not quite as easy. I'm gonna go fairly quickly through this, but if you need more details, there's a ton of resources on the internet that discuss this more. So again, what I'm looking for is this base version of a 30, 60, 90 that I can use then with this similar triangles reason, reasoning anytime I have another 30, 60, 90 degree triangle. Well, in this case right here, um, I want to define one of these lengths. I'm going to define this hypotenuse as two. Again, it doesn't matter what I use because I can change the scale. You'll see why I'm using two in one second. It's gonna make my life a little bit easier as I develop this proof. So the question becomes, is what are these? And I'll just call these A and B right here, these lengths. So if I have this as two, um, what I'm going to do is actually superimpose a second exactly the same triangle. So this same triangle right here, I'm going to flip it, reflect it, and write a version of it right here. And let's see if I can make this look as accurate as possible. So this will have the same measure. This right here is 60, and this one right here is 30 as before. This length is the same. So what can I reason from this? Well, beautifully, since 30 degrees is half of 60, if you look at this entire triangle, what this is now is an equilateral triangle, meaning I have a 60, 60, and 60, degree angles on this triangle. If I know this is an equilateral triangle where all of the angles are the same, that also means, like I used over here, that all of the side lengths are the same. So that's two, that's two, and then this length right here must also be two. Well, if that whole length is two, I know that these are identical and split this down the middle. So that means the value of B here is one. 
Again, that was ultra quick, but again, what I did, I had a, my 306090, I put exactly the same 306090 next to it, realized the whole thing is an equilateral triangle because they're all 60 degree angles, meaning every side length must be exactly the same. It's easy then to reason that these are the same because I took the exactly the same triangle and flipped it over. That length and that length must be identical. So the length of B has to be half of that side length of two which is, by the way, why I use two. It's kind of easy to cut it in half, right? So what I have from that little proof is that I have this 30, 60, 90. So it's 90. This one is the 60. This one is the 30. I know across from the 30, I have a length of one. This hypotenuse, as I defined, is two. So this is one when that is two. Using the Pythagorean theorem, I know that a squared plus one squared equals two squared. This is a squared plus one equals four. Subtract one to get a squared equals three. Square root both sides to get that a equals the square root of three. And a was the length of the side that was the opposite of this 60 degree angle right here. So this is the square root of three. And then uh, just to write it like this, because again, this is the, the 45, 45, 90 with the hypotenuse of length of one. Let's do the same thing with this. I'm gonna flip this one around here uh, just to make it kind of oriented the same way as that other one. That's the 60, that's the 30, um, so if I cut this hypotenuse in half, which is this one right here, uh, that would be one. The side opposite of 30, if I divide that by two, becomes one half. And the side opposite of the 60 would become the square root of three over two.